one there and one here. Okay. Uh, we are struggling a little bit with internet in this room for some reason. I'm not sure why. So Rita, if we, if we lose you, um, my apologies. Um, I see it's already stuttering just a little bit when I hit the record button. Um, I am also recording it for YouTube so that full recording will be available afterwards. Okay. All right. So I'm glad you could all join us. There was one handout. Hopefully you picked it up. Um, it's more for you to take home. It's not something you're going to need so much here. So if you didn't pick it up, you could get it on your way out. Okay. All right. Um, let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, my Jesus, our loving Savior, send your Holy Spirit to be with us here today. Guide our thoughts and our conversation. Help us to understand the real meaning of sacrifice, the real meaning of suffering, and how you reconcile these to yourself. We ask you to inspire our conversation, those who want to share their experience. If they would like to, I'd like to give that opportunity today. Um, and just help us to move forward towards the resurrection and it's in the name of Jesus we pray, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Okay, who can tell me what was the first sacrifice in the Bible? The very first sacrifice. Anybody want to take a guess? Not eat at the tree of this is really a guess. Okay, go ahead, Rita. What is your guess? Abraham and his son Isaac. Okay, that's a good one, but it goes back before that. It goes back to before okay. that. And what did you say? Um, but they did eat from the tree. They did. But the sacrifice has to do with that. So the first sacrifice <clears throat> came after the sin of Adam and Eve, after the fall. And God, let's, let's go to Genesis uh, chapter 3. Let's go to the beginning. Genesis chapter 3. And verses, verses 21 to 24. Three, 21 to 24. There we are. Okay. So Adam and Eve have eaten the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they were not supposed to do that. So that is the first sin was the disobedience to God, the not trusting in God. And here is some of the consequence of that. The Lord God made for the man and his wife garments of skin with which he clothed them. Where did those garments of skin come from? They weren't wool from a sheep, you know, they could have just been shorn and the sheep lives. They were oh, garments of they skin. Had some, they had to kill some animals. Absolutely. Animals had to be killed in order to make those skins, the, the, the clothes of skin. So the very first sin resulted in death, the death of an animal, to hide the shame of Adam and Eve. It would eventually result in their death as well. Then the Lord God said, See, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now what if he also reaches out his hand to take fruit from the tree of life? and eats of it and lives forever. The Lord God therefore banished him from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he had been taken. He expelled the man, stationing the cherubim and the fiery revolving sword east of the Garden of Eden to guard the way to the Tree of Life. And this, as we've talked about before, was so that Adam and Eve 
didn't eat the, free, the fruit of the tree that would enable them to live forever in their fallen state. God wanted redemption first, and then we, then we can live forever. Okay, so the first sacrifice God makes, I thought that was interesting. All right, um, there is a long history of sacrifice. Do I need the microphone, Sharon? Can you hear okay? Can you hear okay? Okay, so I don't need this? All right, awesome. Okay. Um, there, there are a lot of traditions of sacrifice uh, going back through many, many cultures. Um, most cultures have some form of sacrifice, some way that they made offerings to the gods. Um, <clears throat> in the ancient Near East, uh, they had a practice of offering, they felt like, they believed that they were feeding the gods, okay? Um, they would feed them grains, uh, food from the, from the crops, uh, fruits, um, libations, which is the beverages poured out on the ground for them that would be absorbed by the ground. Um, and eventually, uh, they would start offering uh, holocausts of not just the food, but even people. Um, and even the Israelites fell into that too. So we're going to take a, a tiny look at that and, and where that went. There's a lot of references in scripture, but it's often referring to the same time frame of uh, where, where the people started to sacrifice their own children to the ancient gods. Um, and God obviously was not pleased with that. So, all right, um, the next sacrifice we want to look at, though, before we get too deeply into the into those those ideas of sacrifice, let's look at um, again in Genesis chapter four, um, the sacrifices of Cain and Abel, the first two brothers. So chapter four, we're going to begin with verse one. Okay, the man had intercourse with his wife Eve. And she conceived and gave birth to Cain, saying, I have produced a male child with the help of the Lord. Next, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Abel became a herder of flocks and Cain a tiller of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought an offering to the Lord from the fruit of the ground. While Abel, for his part, brought the fatty portion of the firstlings of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and de dejected. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why are you dejected? If you act rightly, you will be accepted. But if not, sin lies in wait at the door. Its urge is for you, yet you can rule over it. All right, so let's take a look at what we just read. We have Cain, who is the eldest, and what is he bringing? What is he bringing to God as his sacrifice? Right, right, the fruit of the soil. So um, Cain is a, is a farmer, you know, and he's bringing his produce to God to offer. And Abel raises livestock, and so he brings, it says, uh, the fatty portion of the firstlings of his flock. So it sounds like he's giving giving from what he got first rather than giving God leftovers, right? So it sounds like that. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't say that there's anything wrong with Abel's, with uh, Cain's offering, though, does it? Does it give us any idea why God did not accept Cain's offering? Have you wondered that yourself? Does anybody have thoughts on that that you want to share? Why do you think that God rejected Cain's offering. What was the difference between the two? I mean, was it the offering itself? God said, I prefer meat today instead of fruits and vegetables? <laughs> or, or, yeah, what do you think? Maybe. You're right. There is a hint that Abel gave the best. 
Um, the wording there, the part that I just read, um, the fatty portion of the firstlings, right? It makes it sound like he brought God the very best to offer. And it doesn't say what Cain did. If he brought um, the choicest of his fruits and vegetables and his grains, or if he just brought, yeah, whatever, we'll just throw a basket together and God will accept it. We don't know that. It doesn't tell us. But there might be a hint in God's response to Cain. <clears throat> the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why are you dejected? So God acknowledged that Cain was upset that God did not accept his sacrifice, but God's asking him why. I think he's wanting Cain to reflect. <clears throat> Excuse me. He's wanting Cain to reflect on what he offered. So is it, is it the best that Cain had to offer or is it not? Another question too is how was it offered? Was it offered because we have to do this? Today's the day, let's go make our sacrifices and get on with our day. Or was it offered with a full heart? Was it offered with, with, with the intention of giving everything to God? So we don't know, but God does say, <clears throat> why are you angry? Why are you de dejected? If Cain had offered the very best he had with the best of intentions, why would he be angry or dejected? Would he not feel like, oh well, I've given my I've given my very best and God rejected? Or or do you think he would feel angry and, and dejected? I think that hints that Cain could have done better. Um, those of you who who have raised children, right? Um, you know when your child comes home, maybe, and they got, a, they got a B plus on the paper, but you know it wasn't their best work anyway. And so you kind of like push them to do a little better. Maybe there was nothing wrong with Cain's sacrifice, but God knows he could do better, whether, whether it was in what he offered or, or the intention, the, the way he offered it. We don't really know. God hints. He says, if you act rightly, you will be accepted. So it kind of indicates that there was something, something amiss in, in Cain's offering. <clears throat> but if not, sin lies in wait at the door. God knows what's coming. And he's giving Cain the opportunity. Sin wants to grab you right now, Cain. Yet you can rule over it. If Cain had turned to God and said, Okay, God, I'm sorry. I probably could have done better. Help me to do better. Maybe it would have ended right there. And instead, in the very next verse, God says, you can rule over it. And then Cain says to his brother Abel, let us go out in the field. When they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Because that always makes things better. So now the Lord really is upset with Cain. <clears throat> And the Lord asked Cain, where is your brother Abel? God, of course, knows. God knows all things. He answered, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? So now he's lying to God. Cain is just, he's, he's on a downhill slide here, right? He didn't offer God his best somehow. He kills his brother. Now he's lying to God. Wow. So what is God going to do to him? God says, what have you done? Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you were banned from the ground that opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. If you till the ground, and remember this is Cain's love, this is what he does, he's a farmer. If you till the ground, it shall no longer give you its produce. You shall become a constant wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, finally he's repenting, my punishment is too great to bear. Look, you've now banished me from the ground. I must avoid you and be a constant wanderer on the earth. Anyone may kill me at sight. Not so, the Lord said to him. If anyone kills Cain, Cain shall be avenged seven times. So the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one would kill him at sight. Cain then left the Lord's presence and settled in the land of Nod east of Eden. So even though God is disappointed with Cain's offering, and even though Cain goes down that, down that terrible slope of sin, 
murders his brother, lies to God. God doesn't destroy Cain. In fact, he marks him so nobody else can kill him either. You're protected, Cain. You have the mark of my protection. What a compassion of God. All right. Um, in the ancient Near East practice of offering sacrifices to the gods, um, oftentimes it was done to appease the gods or to ask for a favor. So it might have been that um, there was a drought, and so all the other people are going to make these offerings uh, to convince the god to send rain. So it, it's, it's almost as if they felt that they could control the gods with the right offerings. Okay, we can make God do this if we do that. You know, that's not our sense of sacrifice and offering to God. So if you do that, if you make sacrifices of your own, okay, God, I will fast every Thursday for the next three months if you do this. That's the wrong, wrong intent. Think Cain. <laughs> wrong intent. We give sacrifice to God out of praise and thanksgiving for who God is, okay? Um, it's, it's grateful praise to God for all that he's given us and, for, and just for who God is in his awesomeness. Um, we don't attempt to control God with our sacrifices. Um, the next example we're going to look at is Noah. Uh, Genesis chapter 8, verse 15. And I tried to count up all the days that they were in the ark. You know, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. That we all know. How long were they in the ark? Anybody know? The problem is it mentions numbers in here, but it doesn't say whether um, that's the same number they were talking about previously. So it mentions 150 days at one point, and then it mentions 150 days again. So is this a second set of 150 days that they were in the ark, or is it the same set of 150? So it's hard to tell, but they were in the ark for a long time, far more than 40 days and 40 nights, because they had to wait for the waters to subside. You know, uh, if we get a heavy rain and you have water sitting in your front yard, you know it's not going to be fine the next day, right? It's going to take, you know, a few days for that water to sink in and, and the ground to, to be able for you to be able to walk on it without getting your shoes all muddy again. All right, so finally, 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 um, the dove goes forth and does not come back to the ark, meaning to Noah, I have found a place. I have found a place, a treetop somewhere that I can call home. So uh, they wait a little bit longer. Uh, let's see. Let's start with verse 15. Then God said to Noah, go out of the ark, together with your wife and your sons and your sons' wives. Bring out with you every living thing that is with you, all creatures, be they birds or animals or crawling things that crawl on the earth, and let them abound on the earth and be fertile and multiply on it. So Noah came out together with his sons and his wife and his, his sons' wives, and all the animals, all the birds, and all the crawling creatures that crawl on the earth went out of the ark by families. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and choosing from every clean animal and every clean bird, he offered burnt offerings on the altar. When the Lord smelled the sweet odor, the Lord said to himself, never again will I curse the ground because of human beings, since the desires of human heart are evil from youth nor will I ever again strike down every living being as I have done. All the days of the earth, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. So, I mean, they have this time on the ark. Let's say they were in the ark half a year, somewhere between half a year and maybe as much as close to a year. So the animals are reproducing, of course, but I mean, the larger animals don't reproduce all that quickly. So here they are, um, they're now on dry land again, and Noah builds an altar to the Lord, and he offers up some of these animals for sacrifice. 
So he's not being stingy. He's not saying, okay, we're supposed to repopulate the earth here, and I only have this many rabbits, right? No, these go to God. They go to God first. The offering goes to God first, and God will take care of everything else. And God saw that offering, and I imagine that he, that he smiled on this offering of Noah. Um, it says he smelled the sweet odor. That makes it sound, doesn't it, that, that God approved, right? It was like a, a fragrance to his nose, this offering of thanksgiving. That's what God smelled, not the burning, burning flesh of the animals, not meat cooking on the fire. He smelled thanksgiving. He smelled appreciation. And I think this is why God said never again, never again would he do this. He saw, the great, he saw that man can be grateful. All right. <clears throat> now, here's one that, that we've read, read about before, but we're going to look at it more deeply. Uh, the sacrifice of Isaac, uh, Genesis chapter 22. Notice we have a lot of sacrificing going on in Genesis in the early days. Not so much in the later days. Before we get into this uh, story of Abraham, I want to go back to the ancient Near East, the pagan religions. Um, they had a practice of sacrificing their children to um, two ancient Near East gods. One was called Moloch, and the other one was called uh, Baal. It, there's like an apostrophe between the two A's. Um, so people would offer their children as sacrifice to these gods. They would take their infants and they would take them and kill them. And then they would be placed into a, a, a fire and burnt up. Um, as sad as that sounds, um, it was pretty common among the ancient Near East peoples. Now the reason for this, I'm not real clear on, so I'm not gonna, I'm not, not gonna even attempt to guess. But as the Israelites, as God's people began to mingle with other cultures, this is one of the reasons God put those, those boundaries. You know, uh, I, I don't want you to intermarry. I don't want you to go into that community without getting rid of everybody else first. He didn't want them to intermingle because what happens is they adopt their religious practices. And so um, let's say a, uh, an Israelite woman would marry a Canaanite man and let's say he has this, this um, worship to one of these ancient Near East gods, and she ends up sacrificing their child to this god. So our god, the god, is saying, I, I don't want you to mingle with other people. You're not ready for that yet. You can't handle it. Um, and I'm not saying that that is the case today. Uh, I was not Catholic when my husband and I got married. I'm glad that wasn't the case. Um, but look what happened. Here we are. Okay, so in the time of Abraham, this sacrifice of children was happening all around him. It was the practice of the pagan nations. Obviously not all of their children. I don't know if it was their firstborn or, or, or on certain occasions. I don't know what the practices were specifically, just that it was rather common. Okay, so when God calls to Abraham and says, I want you to sacrifice your son, Abraham is saddened, but at the same time, this is not such an unusual request, okay? To us, it sounds like, how could God ask such a thing, right? But I wanted to set that stage as far as the practice of child sacrifice before we get into the story, okay? All right, so chapter 22, it's called The Testing of Abraham. And it begins sometime afterward. So when you have an opportunity, you might want to look back and see what was happening before, okay? Um, sometime afterward, God put Abraham to the test and said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son Isaac, your only one, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah. There, offer him up as a burnt offering on one of the heights that I will point out to you. Early the next morning, Abraham saddled his donkey, took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac, and after cutting the wood for the burnt offering, set out for the place of which God had told him. On the third day, 
Abraham caught sight of the place from a distance. Abraham said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while the boy and I go on over there. We will worship and then come back to you. So Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac, while he himself carried, <clears throat> carried the fire and the knife. As the two walked on together, Isaac spoke to his father Abraham. Father, he said. Here I am, he replied. Isaac continued. Here are the fire and the wood, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? My son, Abraham answered. God will provide the sheep for the burnt offering. Then the two walked on together. So before we go on, I want to look at this part. When I was, when I was reading this the other day, preparing for today, um, and Isaac asks, where, where, where is the sheep for the burnt offering? The next words that come out of Abraham's mouth are, my son. Where is the sacrifice? My son. <laughs> you know, it just seems too close to be a coincidence there. Um, but if we go back to the beginning here, God is asking something amazing of Abraham. And we have to understand the promises that God had made to Abraham to really appreciate the depth of, the depths of this. Um, God tells Abraham that he is going to make him the father of many nations, right? He is, his, his descendants are going to be as, as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sands of the earth, right? That's a lot of kids. Okay, now take your son, your only one, and offer him as a sacrifice. Okay, now remember Abraham and Sarah, when they had Isaac, they were very old. They were like 90s and near 100 years old, okay? And Sarah is beyond childbearing years. And, and Abraham, I mean, this is a 100-year-old man, okay? And God is saying, oh, no, no, you know, the promise, yeah, it's, it's going to happen. It didn't happen at first, right? Is this Abraham's only son? No, this is not Abraham's only son. The scripture is not wrong when it says your only son. It's a different way of reading it, okay? Who was Abraham's first son? Ishmael, right, Ishmael. And he was the son of Sarah's handmaid, okay? And Sarah grew impatient with God's promise that she and Abraham were going to have many descendants. So she grew impatient and she said, okay, fine, take my handmaid. Maybe that's how God plans for this to be. And so Hagar conceives and bears Ishmael. And God says to Abraham, no, no, that really wasn't what I had in mind, trust me. But he also blesses Hagar and Ishmael, and that's another story. But he is actually the eldest son. But God is going to bless the union of Abraham and Sarah. And so um, their firstborn together is Isaac. Okay. All right. So take your son, Isaac, your only one whom you love and go to the land of Moriah. There offer him up as a burnt offering on one of the heights that I will point out to you. So he's going to be offered uh, in a way that uh, God will later condemn uh, many times throughout scripture of offering your child as a burnt sacrifice. Okay. But at this point, Abraham is just doing what God told him, okay? Think back to Cain's offering, okay? What was wrong with Cain's offering? We're not sure, but there was something not perfect about it, okay? The sacrifice was not the best he could offer. God is asking Abraham to give him the best he had to offer, and that was his son Isaac. Cain didn't do that. But Abraham's going to. Abraham, he's got his son. They're headed off to make the sacrifice. Can you imagine Abraham's heavy heart? What, is, what do you say to your wife when you're leaving to sacrifice your son? <laughs> um, good question. I, uh, most depictions kind of put him like as a, like a preteen, preteen, early teen. So he wasn't an infant because he's carrying the wood up the hill. So we know he, he was... Uh, 
capable of doing that. So um, at least you're old enough, mature enough to be able to, to help with the sacrifice um, in ways he hadn't planned. But um, yeah, yeah, good question. Yeah, I, I picture him from what I've read uh, around 12 or so. Um, well, yeah, and at this point, he doesn't know. His dad says, hey, you want to go with me to make a sacrifice to God? Sure, Dad, let's go. <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, I suppose it wouldn't have been such an easy track if he had said, okay, uh, so, Isaac, God wants me to sacrifice you. Uh, we're going to leave in the morning, okay? <laughs> bring the matches. Bring the matches. Right. Um, so I, I would suppose he wouldn't tell Isaac for a number of reasons. One, he wouldn't want to cooperate with this, possibly. Um, two, it would cause his son undue anxiety, right? Why get him worried and stressed about something that, that is out of their control? And as far as Abraham's concerned, this is out of their control. God asked, so it will be. Okay? So here they go. Um, notice here, Abraham saddled his donkey, took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac, and after cutting the wood for the burnt offering set out for the place of which God had told him. Let's see. He tells the servants to stay with the donkey. We will worship and then come back to you. He may be wondering in his heart too, what am I going to say to the servants when we get back, when I get back without Isaac? What am I going to say? But then again, the practice of offering children for sacrifice was not unheard of, and they would have said, all right, whatever. So Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering, and where does he put it? Laid it on his son Isaac. He bundled it and put it on his son's back. So here we have Isaac, the innocent victim, walking up the hill, carrying the wood on which he will die. Sound familiar? Okay. All right. Let's read on. Starting with verse 9. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. Next, he bound his son Isaac and put him on top of the wood on the altar. Then Abraham reached out and took the knife to slaughter his son. Wow. First, he's going to tie up this teen. Okay. He's going to tie him up and Isaac's going to be like, Dad, what's going on? Um, Dad, Isaac, I just need you to lie here on this pile of wood here. No, yeah, no worries. Just climb on up here. <laughs> I mean, if he was much older than 12, I don't suppose his 100-plus-year-old father could pick him up and put him on the altar, you know? Um, so there's a lot of things to think about there. So was Isaac, at that point, did his father say to him, Isaac, God has asked us a really big sacrifice? And maybe Isaac said, okay, you know, if, if God said then I'll do it. And maybe he did hop up there on his own and wait for the will of God. I, I don't know. It doesn't tell us. But I wonder about these things. Okay, so we have Isaac now on the top of the altar bound. Then Abraham reached out and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he answered. Do not lay your hand on the boy, said the angel. Do not do the least thing to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you did not withhold from me your son, your only one. Abraham looked up and saw a single ram caught by its horns in the thicket. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering in place of his son. Abraham named that place Yahweh Yira. Hence, people today say, on the mountain, the Lord will provide. A second time, the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven and said, I swear by my very self, oracle of the Lord, that because you acted as you did in not withholding from me your son, your only one, 
I will bless you and make your descendants as countless as the stars of the sky and sands of the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the gates of their enemies. And in your descendants, all the nations of the earth will find blessing because you obeyed my command. Abraham then returned to his servants. I'm surprised it doesn't say Abraham and Isaac. Returned to his servants and they set out together for Beersheba where Abraham lived. So that's a very rich story. And especially as we're approaching Holy Week, I want you to think about the connections. Um, God didn't ask Abraham to do anything that he wouldn't do himself. God offered his only son. And we'll, we'll get into that next week more. Um, but sacrifice is sacrifice. And it's something that once it's offered, well, let me read you a definition. Um, here we go. This definition of sacrifice comes from um, a website called Catholic Dictionary. The highest form of adoration in which a duly authorized priest, in the name of the people, offers a victim an acknowledgement of God's supreme dominion and of total human dependence on God. The victim is at least partially removed from human use. Now remember, it could be a sheep, a goat, a dove, anything. Um, and to that extent, more or less destroyed as an act of submission to the divine majesty. So you don't offer it and then take it home with you. Thus, a sacrifice is not only an oblation. Where an oblation offers something to God, a sacrifice immolates or gives up what is offered. No taking it back. In sacrifice, the gift offered is something precious, completely surrendered by the one making the sacrifice as a token of humble recognition of God's sovereignty. So I like that, especially the end part of that definition. Making the sacrifice as a token of humble recognition of God's sovereignty. So the sacrifice is being made because of who God is, right? We're honoring God. We're saying, wow, God, you are... <laughs> what can I give you that you don't already have, right? So everything we have is a gift from God. So when God asks us to give back, we should not be stingy. It's his anyway. Okay. Um, so Abraham and Isaac, that was important. I want to look at just... Um, if you turn to the book of Exodus, which is the next book in your Bible, Genesis, Exodus, chapter 27, I just want to give you a tiny little view of what altars look like in the Old Testament, in the time of Moses, and thereabouts. So 27 verses 1 to 8. So God is giving Moses the instructions, and Moses is giving the instructions to the people. So God does care about what we offer. He does care about how we offer it. Um, beginning with verse 1 in chapter 27. You shall make an altar of acacia wood on a square, five cubits long, five cubits wide. It shall be three cubits high. At the four corners make horns that are of one piece with the altar. You shall then plate it with bronze. Make pots for removing the ashes as well as shovels, basins, forks, and fire pans. All these utensils you shall make of bronze. Make for it a grating, a bronze network. Make four bronze rings for it, one at each of its four corners. Put it down around the altar on the ground. The network is to be half as high as the altar. You shall also make poles of acacia wood for the altar and plate them with bronze. These poles are to be put through the rings so that they are on either side of the altar when it is carried. Make the altar itself in the form of a hollow box, just as it was shown you on the mountain, so it is to be made. Um, so this is, and the title of that is The Altar for Burnt Offerings. So it starts to sound like they're talking about the Ark of the Covenant, uh, which I started, I started to reread it and think, did I, wait, did I read that wrong? Um, it says The Altar for Burnt Offerings. So the idea was that they could take the altar with them as they were traveling, okay? The altar was the place to do sacrifices. So you wouldn't, um, you know, just set up a fire in your backyard and offer God your goats. There was a place and a way and a manner in which the offerings were to be made, okay? Um, if you turn to chapter 29 in Exodus also, 
This entire chapter is all about sacrifice and the instructions on how to do it. It's interesting to read. If you're interested in this, um, you might want to just mark that and read it later. So the consecration of the priests. <clears throat> the Levites in the Old Testament were, um, of all the sons of Jacob, when they, when they left Egypt and they went to the Promised Land, all the sons of Jacob got portions of land. This territory belongs to Benjamin. This territory belongs to this one, that one, and that one. Um, Joseph did not get any territory. Um, Joseph's, I, I think, nephews, uh, Ephraim and uh, Manasseh, got property instead. Okay, And the tribe of Levi did not get property. They had no land to call their own. But they would become the priests for the people. That was their share. Okay? So one of the things that happens in here is that the priests, uh, the Le Levites, um, those who are serving as priests, get a portion of the sacrifice. So part of the sacrifice is designated, this goes to God, this will be burned up, and this part goes to the priests. This is their payment, basically. This is how they, um, how they live, how they provide for their family, because they have no land to work. So they have no livestock or or farming or anything. This is how they provide for their families, the offerings of the people, okay? Um, so this whole section is about um, the blessing of the priests, and they are blessed with um, sacrifices of, of unleavened cakes with oil. Um, there, there are bulls and rams, and they're sacrificed, and there's blood, and there's, it, I mean, it's, it's a big, big deal. It's a very... Um, ceremonial thing happening here, okay? And so this is how the priests are to be consecrated uh, with their clothing on and everything, and then their clothing is, is consecrated to, made holy uh, for holy use. Um, this is just really interesting, all the detail that goes into here and all the different things that are used in the sacrifice. So part of this is obedience to God. Do it as God has instructed, okay? Um, and it's about where the offerings are coming coming from, too. God gives us everything. This is our way of giving back to God what he's given us. So it's just, just really cool. I, I thought that was interesting. So if you want to read that on your own, you can. Um, the book of Deuteronomy also gives a lot of instructions. Genesis, Exodus, Levit okay, two more books ahead. Pass through Levit Leviticus and go to Deuteronomy. Whoops. Numbers, then Deuteronomy. Sorry. Um, chapter 12, I just want to point this out to you. We're not going to get into a lot of reading. Um, in chapter 12, one center for worship. So one place where the offerings are to be made. Like I said, not just, you know, sacrifice a goat in, in the backyard if you feel like you've sinned. Uh, but there's a way, a procedure, a process of doing this. Okay. Um. When you get to verse 15, there's a word here I just want to help you understand. It says profane and sacred slaughter, okay? Profane doesn't mean what it does in our culture. We have profaned the word profane. <laughs> it doesn't mean what, what it actually means anymore. So profane, profane means not sacred. So there's, there's holy, there's sacred, and then there's profane, okay? So if it's not holy and sacred and not used in that way, if it's used for everyday usage, for instance, it's profane. So a chalice at the altar would be considered sacred, and my coffee cup, even though it has an image of Moses on it, this would be profane for everyday use, okay? So there are different kinds of slaughter, and they, they identify that in here. Um, warning against abominable practices. Uh, this is important <clears throat> because the ancient Near East peoples are offering sacrifice to their gods too. And like I said, when the people intermingled, sometimes the uh, worship practices got, got jumbled and people ended up, well, let's do both. <laughs> you know, I worship my God, you worship yours. Well, let's just worship both. Well, to the, to the one God, that's offensive, right? So... And some of the practices are extremely harmful. So there's a warning against abominable practices. Do not do these things. Okay. Uh, let me see if that's one. 
Okay. All right, I want to give you an example. Um, if, you're, if you're taking notes for things you might want to look up later, I'll just mention these. Uh, chapter 16 in Deuteronomy talks about the, the first Passover. And the first Passover is important because they sacrificed the, the lamb. Um, and the angel of the Lord would pass over, the angel, the angel of death would pass over them. So their houses were marked with the, we, and we've talked about that before. So that is cha uh, chapter 16 of Deuteronomy, if you know, want to know where that is. Um, chapter 18 in Deuteronomy talks about the priests getting their share of the, of the sacrifice and why that's important for their survival. <clears throat> okay. Um, Let's go to uh, go back one book to Leviticus chapter 18. Whoop. Sorry, back a few books. Kind of lost my place. Chapter 18, Leviticus. Okay. And we're going to be looking at verse 21. And there, this is all within um, a chapter called Laws Concerning Sexual Behavior. There's a whole lot of stuff in there. God says, don't do that. That's wrong. Okay. And amongst all of this, when he's talking about uh, infidelity and adultery and all kinds of other things that you can't even picture in your minds, don't even try. Um, he says in verse 21, you shall not offer any of your offspring for immolation to Moloch. Thus profaning the name of your Lord of your God, I am the Lord. So he's making a couple of statements here. I am the Lord, not Moloch. Moloch is nothing, okay. But the the statue of Moloch, if you if you look it up, it's this big statue, and it's got like seven chambers of of altars within it. But in in the at the base of it, there's like a big opening where they would have their fiery holocaust and they would toss the children into this fiery holocaust. Um, I, I can't imagine, I can't imagine if the mothers just distanced themselves from their infants when they were born and just refused to get attached to them, or if they were taken uh, with the moms crying and screaming, and I, I don't know, I cannot even imagine this. But God is saying, do not do that. That is not my way. He also says that in 2 Kings, in um, Ezekiel, in 2 Chronicles, in Jeremiah. So apparently this continues to be a problem for the people. Every time they're encountering these other cultures, for some reason, they're getting drawn into this. <clears throat> and we can look at this and we can say, how, how could they do that? And then we look at our culture today and we look at how many of our infants are being sacrificed through abortion. Um, and I think we have far exceeded what they did. All right. Um, so enough on that. I was surprised that there were so many notations about this. So, so it was evidence to me that this continued to be a problem or at least a temptation for the people of God, that he continues to mention it. Um, Chronicles and Kings are about the time, same time frame as each other. Um, so keep that in mind when you're reading it. It's not that it happened here and here. It's, they're talking about the same incidents in some of those cases. Okay. Um, let's go to the New Testament. We're not going to find much sacrifice in the New Testament. We're going to find sacrifice at the altar when Jesus is... Um, Let's go to Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke. I didn't mark where it is, but okay. Luke chapter 2, uh, verse 22. Luke 2, 22. So this is the presentation of Jesus, okay? This is um, the fourth... Um, Fourth mystery, when you're praying the uh, joyful mysteries of the rosary, 
presentation of Jesus in the temple. When the days were completed for their purification, uh, meaning uh, Mary and Jesus, according to the law of Moses, they took him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, just as is written in the law of the Lord. This is a quote from the Old Testament now. Every male that opens the womb shall be consecrated to the Lord. And then they were to offer the sacrifice of a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons in accordance with the dictate in the law of the Lord. So this is sacrifice here on behalf of Jesus. Okay, so um, let me see here. Okay, it, it says in the footnotes, their purification, it says there must refer to Mary and Joseph, even though the Mosaic law never mentions purification of the husband. Okay, so the wife would have to be purified because there was blood, you know, giving birth. So there was a certain time, certain waiting time that they had to wait for the blood to stop and then uh, present the child in the temple. Okay, um, so they're saying that this purification was for Mary and Joseph. Um, my thought is it would have referred to the child as well. Um, I mean, Jesus was in no need of purification, right? But any child that passes through the womb was covered with blood, right? So, I mean, my thought would lean that way, but that's what the footnote says. Um, <laughs> okay, let's read that footnote further. Recognizing the problem, some Western scribes have altered the text to read his purification, understanding the presentation of Jesus in the temple as a form of purification. <laughs> okay, so you can see there's some confusion there as to how it's interpreted. Um, it says, according to Mosaic law, the woman who gives birth to a boy is unable for 40 days to touch anything sacred or to enter the temple area by reason of her legal impurity. At the end of this period, she is required to offer a year old lamb as a burnt offering and a turtle dove or young pigeon as an expiation of sin. The woman who could not afford a lamb offered instead two, two turtle doves or two young pigeons, as Mary does here. They took him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. It says, Jesus was consecrated to the Lord as the law required, but there was no requirement that this be done at the temple. The concept of a presentation at the temple probably comes from 1 Samuel, where Hannah offered her child Samuel for sanctuary services. The firstborn son should be redeemed by the parents through their payment of five shekels to a member of a, of a priestly family. About this legal requirement, Luke does not say anything. Okay. Um, so the idea of redeeming the firstborn son, the firstborn son belongs to God as Abraham offered his son Isaac to God and he was redeemed with that, with, that, with that sheep that was caught by the horns, right? So Abraham was able to offer the sheep and get his son back, okay? So here the parents come into the temple and they're offering their son to God, um, but they also bring something to buy him back with, okay? That's redemption, is, is buying back. All right. Questions? All right. So uh, I want to move kind of quickly here to... Um, Jesus. Let's look at the Gospel of John. Uh, early on, Jesus is going to get very upset about the temple. And in the Gospel of John, this happens in chapter 2, verse 13. Immediately after Jesus' first public miracle, the, the wedding at Cana, uh, changing the water into wine. So in the Gospel of John, they put the cleansing of the temple at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. Okay, Well, this is going to set the scene for how John portrays the story of Jesus um, where they're always after him where there's constant conflict between Jesus and the Pharisees, Jesus and the scribes, Jesus and the Sadducees, okay? Well, imagine if he went into the temple at the very beginning of his ministry and overturned the tables and threw everybody out with whips. Yeah, I could see them, see them being upset there, okay? The other three gospel writers, the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, put that at the end of his ministry when he comes into Jerusalem the very last time. 
So we can't tell when that actually happened. It seems more likely to me that, that it happened at the end of his ministry rather than the beginning, because if it had happened at the beginning, as it is in John, I think they, they would have tried to stop him a lot, a lot stronger and a lot earlier. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, keep in mind that the, that the writers in scripture, they don't always put things chronologically. Sometimes they put things somewhere to emphasize something or to make a point. And in the whole Gospel of John, John is making a point about who Jesus is. Jesus is the one who existed from the beginning. He is the Son of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. That's how John begins. And we have Luke starting with, you know, the ancestry of Jesus and, and Mary and Joseph and, and the angel and everything. Um, so they have different, different points of emphasis, and that's okay. Don't let that be a struggle for you when you're reading scripture, okay? So regardless, Jesus is in the temple, and he's quite upset. Uh, verse 13, since the Passover of the Jews was near, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He found in the temple area those who sold oxen, sheep, and doves, as well as the money changers seated there. He made a whip out of cords and drove them all out of the temple area with the sheep and oxen and spilled the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who sold doves, he said, take these out of here and stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples recalled the words of scripture, zeal for your house will consume me. At this, the Jews answered and said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered and said to, said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. Therefore, when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. And they came to believe the scripture and the word Jesus had spoken. So in the Gospel of, of John, he's setting this up to be um, the, like the big conflict. Uh, actually, all of them set this up as to be a big conflict with the Pharisees that is, is going to uh, ultimately, ultimately lead them to have Jesus crucified. So um, Jesus is upset. What is the temple for? The temple is for offering sacrifice to God, right? Holy sacrifice to God. We're not exactly sure what the problem is, if it was the, the, the location of where, where these people were. Um, people were supposed to offer sacrifice, and if they came to the temple and, and brought money instead of a sheep, they could buy a sheep there, and then that sheep would be offered for sacrifice. Um, as I'm thinking about this, I'm seeing some problems with that, and I don't know if this is what Jesus saw or not. Um, he says, don't make my father's house a marketplace. Uh, is this the place where people should have been obtaining their sacrifices or should they have brought them? You know, not everybody's a farmer, so not everybody has a sheep, right? So it's nice to have someone who can provide what you need to make the proper sacrifice. Um, some say that the money changers were cheating people in the currency exchanges. Uh, never seen that happen, right? So in Jerusalem, this is where Jews came from all over. Um, there were Jews in Samaria and Jews in other areas of the diaspora outside um, who had been separated from Jerusalem a long time ago. But still on the big feast days, they would come to Jerusalem, all of them. And so over time, they began to speak many different languages. They had different currencies from their hometowns or home countries. And so they would come to the temple. And for their convenience, these money changers would exchange their money into something that was allowable in the temple, which was only the Jewish currency. They weren't allowed to have anything that had uh, pagan images, images of Caesar, images of other gods, or anything that came from their other lands. Only the Jewish currency was permitted. So they, they had to go through the money changer first. Was it the fact that those coins were there at the temple? Maybe that was a problem. I'm not exactly sure what Jesus was so angry about, but maybe they had forgotten the focus of, of the sacrifice. What are we here for? The sacrifice is about God, 
not about the money changers making money, not not a, a marketplace with a lively conversation and the buying and selling. And, you know, a marketplace is kind of a, uh, a happy place, right? Like social socialization, a big social event. I, I'm not sure exactly what it was that Jesus was quite so upset about, but he does say, stop making my father's house a marketplace. It's supposed to be a place of prayer. And somewhere people people lost lost what that was. Jesus hints that he is that his body, the temple of the Holy Spirit, is the one that would rise in three days. And next week we're going to dig more into that. We're going to look at um, Holy Week. We're going to look in particular at Jesus' sacrifice. Um, I just want to make a few comments on that today to make our whole sacrifice thing kind of complete, except for Holy Week. Um, when Jesus makes his sacrifice, he walks up that hill carrying the wood of the cross on which he will be sacrificed. This is the final sacrifice. There is nothing better. We have nothing to give that is better than Jesus himself, right? And if you pray, if you pray the Divine Mercy Chaplet, I offer to you the, uh, the body and blood, soul and divinity of your most dearly beloved son, our Lord Jesus Christ, right? Um, the Divine Mercy Chaplet, um, in my mind, really addresses that Jesus is that perfect sacrifice. There's nothing more we can offer than Jesus himself, right? And so uh, when we're at Mass, we off offer the best we have. We bring bread, we bring wine. And through the, through the, through the Holy Spirit, a, a God comes down and what was bread and wine actually becomes the body and blood of Jesus. And then we're able to offer that sacrifice back to God. We need it changed. We need it changed in order to offer Jesus back to God at the Mass. So I, I think that's just something really, really worth pondering. Okay? So what do we do then? What sacrifice do we offer? This is Lent. So um, Father did a walk, a penance walk yesterday. And... Um, some of you here did, did that walk here, for those of us who knew we couldn't make it 11 miles. Um, but we were all offering sacrifice of some sort, right? If you did this yesterday, you probably went home aching, uh, putting your feet up, uh, getting something really cold to drink, and probably not moving much the rest of the day, or making yourself move so you didn't stiffen up. If we do that just to the point of torturing ourselves, that's meaningless, right? That is meaningless, meaningless suffering. But if we offer, if we join our sufferings, either either things that we choose like that to offer our own penance, um, or sufferings that just come our way, you know, life is life and it comes with sufferings. If we take whatever sufferings we have and we join them to the cross of Jesus, Jesus takes that suffering and he changes it. He redeems it and he makes it usable. The handout that I have for you today are several examples. I think there's five examples in there of people who did exactly that. They were suffering for different reasons. And they every, every moment of suffering, there was one, one person in there who was suffering a lot of physical um, infirmity. And every time she started to feel pain, she would turn to the people around her and say, how can I pray for you today? And she would take their prayers and join them to her suffering and offer it to Jesus. To, to take whatever sufferings that they had in, in this article and offer it to Jesus. Because otherwise we're just suffering for the sake of suffering. And it's meaningless. It's exhausting. But if we know that our suffering might be offered for good, that it might be transformational in some way, all of a sudden it has meaning and life. Does anybody have an experience of that that you might want to share? In one of the art, in, in part of the article, there's a woman who says, you know, when she was younger, she was a teenager. She said, I probably was an annoying a teenager because I would whine and complain about things. And then my grandma would say, offer it up. And in her view, I mean, what do you think of, what did you think of years ago when, when you were told offer it up? Your sufferings are nothing that's insignificant. Um, you know, deal with it. <laughs> um, I don't want to hear about it. I mean, 
what did you hear when somebody said, offer it up? Sometimes I'm not sure that the people who say that understand what it means. But if we take that suffering and we offer it up to God and say, God, the suffering means nothing to me, but you can do something with it. You can transform the suffering and, make, and give it meaning. Whether I see that meaning or not, you can make it transfor transformational. You can make it redeeming. And there's one in there, um, a story in there about someone whose grandchildren were converted because they offered their suffering to God. So sometimes we see the fruits of that and they share that in, in that article. And sometimes we don't, but we still have to trust that God is good and loving and that God uses, uses our suffering. He joins himself to us. Jesus joined himself in our suffering just by becoming human, okay? I mean, think about that. When Jesus was, was maybe a year old, he had to learn to walk just like we did. He stumbled and he fell and he skinned his knees just like we did. So from the beginning of his life, Jesus suffered just like we do. He knows, he gets it. So give it back to him. He can transform it. He can do something good with it. All right. Um, so next time, when we get back together on Monday, next week is our last class together um, for a while. And um, two things. One, it's going to be all about Holy Week next week. So we're going to be in the New Testament, all about Holy Week. We might jump back to the Old Testament a couple of times to give a point of reference. Uh, but mostly New Testament, um, Holy Week, what happens during Holy Week and how do we celebrate. And um, the other thing is, if you want to do another Bible study, um, let me know what you're interested in, okay? Um, we can do this kind of a format if you'd like, uh, where I teach you on a topic, like this was all about Lent and growing through Lent. We did one on parables last Lent. We've done wisdom, uh, wisdom uh, Psalms and wisdom books, and, and we did Messianic prophecies. We've done a lot with our Bible studies. But if there's something you would like to study that we haven't, uh, please let me know, and we can we could we could study a book of the Bible. We could focus just on one book, on one writer. We could focus on a theme. We could I mean, there's a whole lot. If you want to read about women in the Bible, we could do that. Um, as somebody mentioned Revelation, the book of Revelation is complicated. Uh, there's a lot of symbolism in it. Um, and if we were to do Revelation, I would follow a study by um, Dr. Scott Hahn. He has a, a video on it and a book, and we would all get the book and we'd follow along with that. Uh, he does a really nice job of connecting the book of Revelation to Mass, what happens at Mass. So um, think about what you'd, like to, what you'd like to discover as we move forward, and um, just send me, send me an email or drop me a note or catch me on the sidewalk or whatever, and just let me know what you, what you would like to do. Um, so we can change up the format if you'd like. I would like for it to be more interactive, but I think as soon as we get rid of the face masks and the distance and the shields and, and all that, and we're all together again the way that we ought to be, I think that would that will be helpful. So I kind of like to sit with you guys rather than being over here. So, all right. Um, shall we close with a prayer? Or Are there any questions or, or comments on today? Sure. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, sometimes I feel like I'm jumping around, but it... it, it you want to tie it all in. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, any questions? Great job, Emily. Thank you, Rita. Great job. Thumbs up to you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, all right. So let's close with a prayer then. All right. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Good and gracious God, help us to offer holy sacrifice to you. Help, a, help us to offer the very best of what we have to you. Help us to offer it with a, with a contrite heart, a heart full of love and praise and thanksgiving for all that you've done for us and for who you are as God. We ask you to cleanse, of, cleanse us of any impurities in our offerings so that what we offer you is always our very best. We ask you to continue this journey with us up to Easter 
so that we may rejoice as we pass through Holy Week in the difficulties and the struggles and the sufferings. We look forward to the resurrection of Jesus. We look forward to our own resurrec resurrection in time. And we look for forward to the resurrection of the church, for we feel like we've been We've been traveling through Lent a very long time, and like we're, we're traveling through our own Holy Week of sorts as a church. And we pray for that resurrection that only comes from you. In the precious name of Jesus, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever, amen. All right, well, thank you all for joining me, and I'll see you next week.